for the entirety of this life rather than seeking God. And they're going to think they're, they're making ahead, they're making profit, they're making progress. But they're going to find out that just 70 years was just a day in God's eyes. I want to tell you a parable. There was an island village that would adopt a new king every year. Volunteers were requested, but usually there were no more than one person who would apply. Not many people wanted the position, but whoever became king would absolutely live like a king for the next whole year. Every luxury known would be afforded to the king. He'd be given a palace of comfort. Every pleasure desired would be fulfilled. He had slaves awaiting his commands. Money was no issue. He could have up to 10 wives. The finest food was prepared for him daily. Massages, manicures, pedicures, the works. Pampered like a king. The only problem was the king would be tossed into the volcano at the end of the year to please the great lava god so that the volcano wouldn't erupt and kill them all. It was a simple transaction with a very high price tag. Okay, so we're talking about Neanderthals here, okay? And, uh, and they're, they're doing human sacrifice. Somehow it got in their brains. And so they figure we'll make a deal. We'll treat someone like a king. We'll spoil them. And then if they will, if they will be our next victim, we'll treat them like a king and we'll toss them in and we'll look for the next one. So the question is, would you enjoy a year of immense pleasure, no consequences, no guilt, for the price of flaming death? What would you exchange your soul for? Do you have a high price tag? And I hope that you do. Now we'll go to Matthew 16. And we'll let Jesus ask that same question. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But Jesus turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Peter. No, he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for you savor not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, next page please. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now that implies not just dying at the hands of of the elders, chief priests, and scribes, but possibly dying at the, at the cross. He says, if anyone will come after me, if anybody wants to be a Christian, if anyone wants to continue in my teaching, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, the only people carrying crosses through the city are the people who are carrying their crosses so they can be used to be crucified on them. He said, for whoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world, be a king for a day, and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What kind of transaction are you willing to make to say, yeah, for that, I'll shove Jesus aside. What is it? What's your price tag? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. So what do you savor? What do you enjoy? The things of God or the things of man? What would you? Give an exchange for your soul. Well, for some of us, what did you give an exchange for your soul? Because I know that not everybody in church is in church. I know that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is actually serving God. God knows who are his. 
And sometimes there might be hypocrites among us. Our job is not to judge them. Our job is to reach out and save them. Amen. We want to invite you to a closer walk with Jesus. Amen. Because the human heart, the human heart is so full of deception. It'll fool you. It'll teach you to compromise. It'll teach you to make compromises and deals and deceptions. You think you're fooling everybody else. You think you're fooling God. You're just fooling yourself. And so we need sermons like this to wake us up. Have I allowed something to take a place that God should be taken in my heart? There's a throne in your heart because you're a temple. Who is sitting on that throne? What is sitting on that throne? It needs to be Jesus. If you want to have an incredible life on this planet and an incredible life after this planet, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord Jesus, you'll help us to take this message to heart today, Lord God. Oh, the devil might try to convince us that the pleasures of this world are so much more desirable than anything you could possibly promise on this planet or after this planet. Help us not to buy that lie, Lord Jesus. Even walking with you, Lord, is an, is an incredible adventure. And I pray that everyone who hasn't discovered that adventure yet will open themselves up to it because you have to open yourself up. You have to say that it's possible and you have to seek it and taste and see that the Lord is good. And then once you've discovered it, you'll never go back to the dry, boring, bland life of a hypocrite. We don't want to be casual Christians, Lord God. We want to be life-changing, world-transforming Christians, Lord God. We want to be planet shakers, Lord. We want to be your ambassadors, Lord God, and your soul winners like Paul and Barnabas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pray that your heart is like that, like my heart is too. I never wanted to be just another Christian in just another pew. Amen. It would be a nightmare to me to be just another person who just comes to church, hears a pretty message, and goes home, and my life is not changed. Amen. Amen. So allow your life to be changed and allow God to use you in other ministries through the work. Now, I was reading a Christian magazine this week, and I found um, a very interesting dynamic that they discovered. These people were just trying to find out trends in society. In about the 1930s, they began doing these things called surveys. It began with a guy named Gallup, the Gallup surveys. They began asking questions about life and, and attitudes and politics, and then they began expanding to religion. And, um, and so if after a while, the Christians began taking over the, the religion sermons because we want to know what the people are like. We want to know, you know, how can you love your neighbor if you don't know what your neighbor believes and so we would do surveys and um, and there was a Christian group asking people about their faith they were doing all you they were using all the survey st standards and they were calling people and they were asking them simple questions about the faith and they were random and they were anonymous the person on the other side didn't know who this person was and they could be in the next state the next county they can be anywhere but they were finding out that in their surveys, they were discovering there was an incredible increase of people reading their Bibles. They're thinking, wow, the, the national average is like 60% of the people read their Bible a little bit, but we're getting like 68% of the people are reading their Bible. But even though they found that more people were reading the Bible, they didn't see any increase in prayer or church attendance or relationships with God. They thought, how can this be? How can more people be reading the Bible, but nothing else has changed? They couldn't figure it out. So again, they actually said, let's just uh, drop the telephone survey for a little bit. Let's do an online survey. The internet came out, you know, and they began doing that survey through the internet. It was equally anonymous and they were getting the same amounts of feedback, but they were discovering the national average of people reading their Bible. It, it went from, from 68 back down to 60%. They thought, why is it? Why is it when we call people and ask them if they read their Bible, they're more likely to say yes, but if we ask them in an anonymous survey, they're more likely to tell us the truth. And they came up with something. They called it a social desirability bias. They said, you know what? It looks like that people might overstate their Bible reading if they suspect the person on the other side of the phone will think more highly of them, even if they don't know them. It's anonymous. 
people want to be liked. And it turns out that they exaggerate. And they exaggerated quite a bit. And so they permanently stopped phone surveys. They thought, you know what, when we talk person to person, there's this dynamic where a person wants to be liked and they'll say what they think the other person wants to hear because they want to be liked even though they're gonna hang up and never see them again. Interesting, isn't it? Social desirability bias. So, oh, it's the social desirability bias that causes people to say they read their Bible when they don't read their Bible. And the social desirability bias that causes people to say they pray when they don't pray. That social desirability bias that causes people to say they witness and feed the poor and give to missions. They want you to respect them. They want you to like them. So they say what they think you want to hear. And it costs them exactly nothing to say those words, except maybe a brief momentary twinge of guilt for having lied. I'm talking about Christians. Now I'm talking about the church. If they're not reading the Bible or praying or witnessing or feeding the poor, what are they doing? They have just as much time in their week as anyone who does. They're living like kings on an island with volcanoes on them. Is that you today? I'm trying to wake us up. If, this, if that's you, if you're the person who tells people you read the Bible when you don't read the Bible, if you tell people you pray when you don't pray, you're living on an island. You're living like a king. But there's a volcano on that island with your name on it. You've exchanged a walk with God for the temporary pleasures that you'd rather make time for. And it might land you in fire. So what do you do instead of walking with God in prayer and Bible reading? Do you sell your soul for Netflix? Do you sell your soul for popularity with non-Christians? Did you sell your soul for porn and premarital sexual relations? Did you sell your soul for unrestrained pleasures of every kind? Music, anime, computer games, hobbies, social media, alcohol. A lot of these things are harmless. Not all. And they can be enjoyed in moderation. But when something takes the time and the attention over prayer and Bible reading, then you've made a transaction. You've made an exchange that might cost you your soul. It's my job to warn you, but let me try to sell you instead. I wanna go positive. In Psalms 119, we'll go to our next passage. In Psalms 119, listen to this. This is what the Bible can do for you. If you haven't cracked open the Bible, you might think it's an encyclopedia. Or you might think it's like Shakespeare, where every, every sentence needs a, a scholar to interpret it for you. You'll discover the Bible is very easy to understand. Not perfectly easy, but it's very easy. Psalms 119 verse 9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Amen. These are anchors in my, my soul. I, I, these are promises that I claim that I've built my life around. That's why I read my Bible because I want to cleanse my way and I want to, I want to make sure that I, I can avoid sinning against God. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. When you read the Bible, it gives direction. You understand life better. You understand the world better. You understand your neighbors better. You're, you understand yourself better. You understand your workmates and your, you, you understand the media better. 
Because the Bible sheds light on all these things and gives you understanding and you're no longer being led by the media and being led by society, but you're now being led by God. He's shining a light saying, here's where you need to walk. Here's the safe way. Here's the prosperous way. Amen. You can't get that in any other book. What an incredible benefit it is to read your Bible. There are educational stories. We get to read Paul's letters to his churches he founded. We get to read parables. There's songs. There's proverbs. There's metaphors. There's prophecy. I want to get you hungry for this. I don't want to spank you into reading the Word of God. Amen. I want to lure you in. There is much gain there. There is much. Honest. I remember when I was young. I was about maybe 18. I've already been reading my Bible quite a bit. Like I told you before, I was Second Timothy before somebody finally got the guts to invite me to church. So I was already a Bible reader. And I was, I was going on a church function on a bus with our church guys. I just got my new Bible in the mail. And I opened a box and I opened up. It was like, it was like pages of silver with letters of gold. And I came across a book called Zephaniah. I thought, wow, a book called Zephaniah. Does your Bible have Zephaniah? I don't remember hearing about Zephaniah, you know. And, and honest, after having read Job and Genesis and Exodus, I couldn't wait to dive into Zephaniah. Because again, the Bible was actually doing something to me. It was feeding me in a way I've never been fed before. I was a little, I was a little bookworm. You know, I used to read science fiction. And I used to read lots of... Um, the encyclopedias, you know, the World Book Encyclopedia that came out in 1976. I was always just grab a volume and just, and just read that, like Sister Anne's brother, Uncle Muneer, um, who's pastoring in Campbelltown. He, we, we were raised on the same encyclopedia. There must be something special about that encyclopedia. because. But, you know, when I found the Bible, I found a jackpot of the most empowering, transforming information that I've ever experienced in my life. I want to sell you on this. You've got to read your Bible. Amen. I tried reading it before I became a Christian. When I was about maybe 12 or 13, I thought, well, to be a well-rounded scholar and critic of everybody else, I, uh, I should read the Bible. I cracked it open. It made no sense to me whatsoever. But after I came to faith and my brother got me a Bible, it was alive. It was like it was a different book altogether. Amen. You're not going to understand it if you're not walking with God. But when you crack it open, hungry, God's going to meet you there. The Holy Ghost will be there. The same Holy Ghost that inspired it 2,000 years ago is going to be there to explain it to you and illuminate it to you. Amen? Don't you want that heavenly supernatural exchange? You're dabbling in the supernatural. Oh, I know that the, 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 those little, what do you call them, fortune tellers and and new age people think they have the corner on the market on the supernatural they don't they got the, they got the corner on the market on used goods broken goods if you want supernatural encounters crack open your bible and be hungry and say god i'm going to open my bible and i'm going to open my heart show me and teach me your way amen and you're doing what psalms 119 told you to do a long time ago amen and you will find incredible wisdom and knowledge there. Amen. I want to sell you one. I want you to say, I can't wait for this sermon to get finished so I can go home and read my Bible. That's what I want you to be feeling like right now. And I hope you're feeling it. Amen. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 6. And we'll take an example. Next page, please. In verse 1, Jesus said, Take heed that you do not do your alms before men. To be seen of them don't say hey here's my big offering bring me that basket come on hurry up you know and that, that envelope's heavy you know you wonder when to see how heavy this envelope you don't do your alms before men to be seen of them otherwise you'll have no reward of your father which is in heaven again that's looking for the praise of man isn't it you don't need to be looking for the praise of man you need to be looking for the praise of god amen your father your creator your savior we need to be trying to impress him. On a side note, I remember growing up as a kid, going through my 20s and thinking, you know what? Whatever girl I settle on to be my wife, I would always think, what's dad going to think about this one? I wanted to impress my dad. 
Not that I wanted to razzle dazzle him that my wife was cuter than his wife, but I want to impress him with a wife who's respectable, a wife who's sensible and pretty helps. Amen. And I hope, I hope that we can be that way about our God. I hope we can be that way about our Heavenly Father, that everything we do, we say to ourselves, what does dad think about this? When you finish something, when you teach a Sunday school lesson or teach a Bible study, I want you to be saying, I wonder what dad thinks about that. I wonder what my Heavenly Father, did I, did I study enough to impress him? Was I thoughtful enough and sensitive during the teaching of the Bible study to impress them that I wasn't just trying to impress the people, but I was trying to educate them and, and lead them. Because we can try to impress the people how smart we are, but what's more important, because that's getting the praise of man, what's more important is actually impressing them their need for Jesus. Amen. And encouraging them to take up that walk and walk with Jesus. Amen. That is beneficial. I got distracted, didn't I, here? Okay, so... Verse 2, therefore, when you do your alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when you do your alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Be subtle, that your alms may be in secret, and your Father, which sees in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. How's that for light to your feet? And a lamp to your path. Amen. We'll go to our next page here. Starting in verse 5. He says, he continues. He says, when you pray. He didn't say if you pray. When you pray. Amen. He's counting on you praying and talking to God and sharing life with God. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street where everyone can be seen. They can be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They're seeking the praise of men, and they're getting the praise of men. They're seeking the approval and the respect, and they're getting it. They've got their reward. But you, when you pray, enter into your closet. And when you've shut the door, pray to your Father, which is in secret. And your Father, which sees in secret, shall reward you openly. Amen. This is how he encourages us to live. And how to walk, amen? Because it's possible you can be doing the right things for the wrong reasons. And I can imagine being raised in a church. Second generation Pentecostals, you might be raised and told what you need to do. And you might even do it. But it's possible, you have to check your heart. It's possible you might be doing the right things for the wrong reasons. That's why I encourage you to seek out God with all your heart with all your heart don't just just don't just try to impress god with the things you're doing but try to do them with intention and do them with hunger and do them with sincerity because again that's when it becomes a supernatural event that's when god sits down at the table with you says let me show you something you know and he, he starts leading you he starts speaking to you he might convict you of sin he might encourage you to do something he might you might just enjoy his company. There's been a couple times where I've just gone to a prayer room and I wasn't in the mood to pray and I prayed and I thought, well, I really felt the company of God there. I really felt fellowship with God. I didn't expect it. What an incredible blessing, what a bonus. And you're gonna have those kinds of moments, amen. Everything we do for Jesus, first of all, needs to be done for real. And then we got to check our hearts to make sure we're doing it the right way and for the right reason. Watch out for those ulterior motives. Don't just do it to make someone impressed that you're doing it. I wasn't raised in the church, so I didn't have any Christian parents to impress. But I would wait till they went to sleep. Then I'd close the door, turn the light, and read my Bible. Because actually, I thought they might make fun of me. <laughs> so, so, you know, sometimes persecution can be healthy. You know, living in an in a environment that's not positive towards Christianity can help make us stronger. Let's take advantage of that. The devil wants to use persecution to push us down and make us feeling ashamed for being a Christian. Why don't we use it as, as momentum to do the right thing, even though we're not supposed to do the right thing as far as the world's concerned? Amen? Amen. We, we can try to use persecution. You'll find that countries that have incredible persecution also have incredible revival movements going on. China is oppressing religion. They have who knows how many more 
thousands, maybe tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Pentecostals baptized in Jesus' name, speaking in tongues in China because it's illegal. And I remember when the wall came down, the communist wall came down in 1988, 1989. We had people coming to Bible college from Bulgaria and Romania. And they're like fifth generation Pentecostals coming out from the Iron Curtain. They were having revival. They were having souls won. This guy says, you know, my, pa my father is a pastor. He, he leads over 200 churches in Bulgaria. And we're thinking, I thought it was illegal. Yes, it was illegal. But the persecution actually made them tough. There were no wimpy Christians. There were no casual Christians. They grew up tough. Amen. But we raise an environment that says we're free to do these kinds of things. And what happens? We get lazy. We have to watch out for that. It happens to all of us, old and young. It happens to all of us. We can all find an easy path. So what can get in the way of these two simple stuffs of doing the right things for the right reasons? The fact that it's inconvenient. Deep down, our flesh, which has a loud voice in our decision making as humans, our flesh wants to live like kings. But we don't want to be tossed into the volcano. We want the best of both worlds. We want to do everything we're not supposed to do and then not get punished at the end. But you can't have it both ways, brothers and sisters. You can't. You can't live a life of disobedience and expect to learn the reward of the righteous. And I don't mean disobedience as in living in terrible sin, but I mean dis disobedience of simply not living for Jesus. Going to church. Saying the right words. Being a nice person. But not living for Jesus. And you're selling yourself short. Your week is all for you. Your week is for your pleasures, for the things you enjoy. And it's not for Jesus. In Matthew 16, 27, it says, The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. Jesus said that before when he said, What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? We're not going to be rewarded for what we should have done. We're not going to be rewarded for who we knew we should have been. We're not going to be rewarded for who we even wished we could have been. You might say, but it was every intention of my heart was in my heart. I just didn't do it, but I really wanted to. The, the wish was there. I knew what was right. But our works will demonstrate exactly where our heart was and what our faith was. Every hopeful ambition and every good intention where our heart was what our faith was will give us no value. It's funny, many people know how to lose weight, but they just don't do it. I know all you got to do is exercise more and eat less, but we have to make up these fancy diets <laughs> and give them crazy names. Keto, Paleo, Dukin. We make all these diets. It's, just not, it's not rocket science. Eat less and exercise more, but we can't do it. Our flesh wars against our mind and our flesh usually wins and in this battle we're walking for Jesus Christ we got to make sure our flesh does not win brothers and sisters we have to put our flesh under our thumb and say listen you need to be in subjection to the word of God the spirit needs to get strong how's your spirit going to get strong by hanging out with Jesus and talking and doing life with Jesus amen we got to pray we got to invite Jesus into our life we got to read the Bible as well amen I'd like to ask brother boy to come in and get ready to help us wrap up. We got to remember that we're not kings on this earth. We're children of the king. One day he's going to give us, you know, authority over the nations. That's in a prophecy. But right now we're not kings. We're children of the king. And we got to make sure that we're not too cheap to pay the price for righteousness and holiness. Yes, there are going to be sacrifices. I invite you to make those sacrifices. Yes, there are going to be temptations. And I invite you to say no to temptations. There's going to be challenges. And I encourage you to rise up to the challenge. There's going to be tribulations. I'm going to encourage you to hang in there through the tribulations. Amen? Because we need to remember it's going to be worth it all. Amen?
a G. It's going to be worth it all. <laughs> it's going to be worth it all. C. It's going to be worth it all. D. It's going to be worth it all. Some beautiful, happy day. Amen. It's going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth it all. D. It's going to be worth it all. Some beautiful, happy day. It's going to be worth every long mile, every heartache and every trial. It's going to be worth it all, some beautiful, happy day. We'll hold that now for a moment. I want you to get that message. It's going to be worth it all, brothers and sisters. It is. Trials, sacrifices, temptations, tribulations. There's light on the other side of that mountain, amen. The mountain shields the sun. You sometimes wonder if it's even out there. Where is God? But God's given us some promises. And in Revelation and 1 John, next, next page, please. I want you to read some of these things. Who is it? He that overcomes the world. But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now again, if you believe, it's not the, it doesn't mean it's up here. It means it's all around here. Amen. You are believing and you are living it because you believe it. He that lives for Jesus because he knows he's the Son of God is he that will overcome. In Revelation 2, 7, Jesus said... To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. Do you want that? Amen. Revelation 2.11. To he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Amen. There's two, rap there's two raptures. There's two resurrections. The resurrection of life and the second death. I'll put this in messenger. Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in a white garment. I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Revelation 3, 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more, and I will write upon him my new name. Revelation 21, 7. God brings up this topic again, and he says, He that overcometh, shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. Why don't we stand? Amen. I want to encourage you to praise your way into walking with Jesus. Today, let's celebrate the promise he's given us and then I want you to go home and read your Bibles. I want you to go home and pray. I want you to open and say, God, meet me here. Let's do this together because God wants to do life with you. He wants to guide you. He wants to guard you. He wants to direct you. He wants to advise you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to correct you. And he wants to live forever with you. That's what it's all about. This phrase comes up all the time from the beginning to the end. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Will you be in that number? Will you overcome with Jesus? This is the invitation. Now you might have to, you might be saying yes now, but you got to go home and say yes and crack open your Bible and begin a walk with God. Amen. Go into your bedroom, shut the door behind you and begin a walk with God. Just start talking to him. Even if you don't know how to talk to God, say, God, meet me here. I knew zero, but I talked to God. I read a chapter of my Bible, maybe two chapters, I talk to God. I, didn't, I can't remember what I was saying. It was a lot of repentance because I didn't know when I can stop repenting. And then someone invited me to church. It began, the pieces began falling together. But let's do this, shall we? I want you to sing a song with me. It's going to be worth it all. G, C, and D. It's going to be worth it all. C, it's going to be worth it all. D. It's going to be worth it all, some beautiful, happy day, good. It's going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth it all, D. It's going to be worth it all, some beautiful, happy day. One more time, G. It's going to be worth it all, C. It's going to be worth it all, D. It's going to be worth it all, some beautiful, happy day. Well, it's going to be worth every long mile, every heartache and every trial. It's going to be worth it all, some beautiful, happy day. G, C, D, C, G. It's going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth it all. 
It's going to be worth it all. So beautiful and happy day. Amen. Let's wrap that up. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you'll help us today, Lord God. Help us to really see the invitation. You're knocking. You said, I'm knocking. Please, someone open the door and I will come in. I will sup with you. You demonstrated that you're hungry. You demonstrated that you loved us. You died on our behalf long before we were even born. And you loved us, Lord God. And so I pray, help us to respond to your love today. Help us not to be chased and tasered and, 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 and bullied into worshiping you and loving you. But Lord, today, let us accept your invitation, your loving invitation to walk with you, Lord God. I pray that someone will take these words today and go home and experience transformation for the first time. They'll, 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 they have been a Christian maybe for the past three, five, ten years, but they're going to go home today and really discover what it means to be a Christian. And they're going to be saying, man, I can't believe I've been ripped off ten years of being a casual Christian. Ten years of being a wimpy Christian. Man, I am so mad at myself for, for short changing myself. I'm going to go full steam ahead and worship and love God with everything that I have and do it right. And I'm going to be like these apostles who ministered unto God rather than asking God every day to minister unto them. Help us to turn the tables, Lord God. Help us to turn the tables. You've been good to us. So, Lord, now let us turn and be good to you. Help us to find your will and do it with all your heart. You said you came to seek and to save that which is lost. Lord, help us to pick up that burden and help us to carry it with you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's talk to Jesus now. Hallelujah.